Hi, I'm Jim Alvey from Good360. I'm the Vice President of Disaster Recovery. I'm going to share with you some findings that I have from a delegation of nonprofits and for profits and government uh, delegates that went to Maui in December. I will update you as, as possible for there's been some progress, which is great to be able to report on, but I think you'll find the information useful and you can find a place that your organization can help. So I'm gonna share my screen and some slides. So in December, a delegation from After the Fire, a nonprofit based in California focused on wildfire resilience and recovery, went to Maui uh, to see what damage had, had occurred, uh, try to find some need gaps and obviously some intel for ways that nonprofits and government entities could help. As you all know, uh, Lahaina was much loved. Uh, it's a small area on the island of Maui, um, but really significant in terms of its location and its historical value to uh, Hawaiians. And of course, those of us that went there uh, fell in love with it. So there was massive destruction uh, that we'll talk about beginning on August 8th, 2023. The wildfire uh, spread rapidly. Um, once it, it was started uh, and winds from a hurricane that was active at the same exact time uh, made it much more dangerous and, and much more damaging. Uh, over 100 people lost their lives, destroyed over 3,800 housing units. Uh, over 50% of those were renters. Over 12,000 residents were initially displaced with 8,000 that were housed in congregate shelters. Uh, over 5,000 remained at the original uh, time that we put this report together in 30 plus hotel rooms. Those um, folks are now being moved out of those locations, uh, causing another challenge that we'll talk about in a second. Lahaina lost approximately 800 businesses. And of course that impacted uh, those that work there, uh, over 7,000 employees. These are photos from uh, the delegation. You can see the, the damage and our friends at uh, Samaritan's Purse working on um, working through the, the ash, which we'll talk about next. These are the major issue, issues and need gaps, ash debris, removal and relocation. It's a huge amount of ash that they are still working through. There was a significant housing shortage before the event, and then this just created a more significant problem. There was fragile or, or missing infrastructure going into the disaster, water, utilities, and sewer. And now in the rebuild process, that's become a challenge. Economic revitalization for local businesses and former employees. We talked about the fact that the impact was huge for those folks that worked in that area of Maui in Lahaina. And that's an area of, of concern. Communication rose as one of the top issues uh, between governments and nonprofits, both sides thinking they're doing something right and not communicating effectively between each other. Resilient building efforts are needed to better be prepared for the next event, uh, future flood, wind, fire events, uh, whatever else is thrown at the island. They need to be better prepared for it. This Lahaina situation um, was impacted by the construction of the, of the buildings, of course. There's long-term issues from colonialism. This is something that we haven't seen before, disaster spaces that I've worked in, and it's been significant in terms of a cultural understanding, as well as a lack of trust, challenging permit issues, and other ramifications. And then finally, Maui survivors and leaders are dealing with trauma and mental wellness issues. The response period was ex exceptionally long. We're just now getting out of it and entering the re recovery period. That has been draining on every volunteer and every agency participant. Uh, so there's concerns around that. So I'm just, just gonna uh, highlight a couple of uh, the key challenges of just a little more depth. Uh, housing, again, short-term uh, survivors did not go to congregate shelters. Many of them went to relatives, friends, and rentals. That created a gap uh, of survivors who were not uh, uh, being attended to in terms of their needs. Non-congregate housing created logistical challenges for distributions, and then they were also moved out of those locations every 30 days as, as standard in the disaster space, but it was not uh, a good process for an elongated response period. In the long-term, unique low-income, high property value uh, market that was there already came with inherent issues. 
Um, there thankfully have been put in place some new incentive programs asking short-term rental owners to rent their homes at market uh, rate to create a pool of, of units. And then also creativity, eco and tiny homes are being built that they are challenged with the same issues of land and permits, but there's progress. Infrastructure, water is owned by commercial entities based on old laws that favored businesses and tourism. 2,200 water service lines were damaged in Lahaina and it will take years and an estimated $80 million to restore, but that has to be done. Now that's a challenge because it's going to take a lot of work to get past those age old regulations that uh, make those uh, properties, the water uh, and other utilities owned by private entities. Sewer lines, similarly, the initial fire was, uh, was reportedly caused by fallen utility bowls and wires. Uh, exacerbated by the high winds. There is an aggressive effort to place those underground. And the roads, existing roads were largely destroyed uh, within Lahaina. Uh, work trucks will only make that worse, but uh, the delegation that we went with was able to identify multiple government grants opportunities to help with much of that expense. So again, a positive. Uh, challenges, making sure you're, you're paying attention here. It, it is a pain in the ash. Uh, ash remediation, long rains may carry the toxic uh, ash into the ocean. And of course that would uh, kill fish and, and other uh, wildlife and, and pose health issues. The county sprayed chemical substance to hold the ash in, in place. Uh, they are um, working on getting the ash out. Good360 is working with a bioremediation group that's on Maui. Uh, to help detoxify the ash and, and build a um, sock around the area to avoid uh, it uh, entering areas that uh, it could possibly uh, impact. Removal, there's just a ton. Well, actually there's 400,000 cubic yards of debris and toxic ash. They've started moving it out. They have a third of it removed to, a, to one location. It's taking up a lot more space and, and challenged uh, more than they thought. It also contains the remains, unfortunately, of the 100 who perished in the fire. So it, it's it got um, some Hawaiian uh, sacred um, issues that we have to consider about where those go. And, and it's it's been challenging to try to figure out the right way to handle the ash. It can't just be removed and, and put any place. Um, other challenges, we mentioned communication, the governor, mayor, county, county, uh, county council officials feel they're responding appropriately to the needs of the community, and they are from our observations. However, survivors and local nonprofits feel they're being left out of the discussions, not being heard, concerned that key decisions are being made in a bubble. Um, we suggested the concept of zone or block captains that's being considered as community liaisons were offered. And within the Hawaiian uh, culture, there are already pre-designated leaders in specific communities. So this is something that's started to take off. We have seen improvement in communication since uh, the December delegation. A multi-agency warehouse is needed. This is something near and dear to Good360 as we always find that to get products efficiently distributed in a disaster, post-disaster, requires warehouse space. So we've been working with FEMA, Global Empowerment Mission, Maui Rapid Response on short and long-term solutions, and we have some. We've been able to secure a couple of locations for short-term uh, needs for those moving out of the, uh, the hotels and non-congregate sheltering, and as well as larger locations to be able to receive containers of product for long-term recovery. Data and data sharing, um, this is a consistent challenge for um, disasters and certainly uh, more of a problem here in that the response phase lasted so long, lots of support was being provided through case uh, management that wasn't being shared because there wasn't a process put in place for it. Now those those entities are working together, a hub cohort of nonprofits that created a, their own platform for matching and sharing, and that's come a long way. And then survivor volunteer government responder burnout. So we talked about this before, response phase lasting so long, survivors stuck in limbo versus recovery. So they need a lot of care, um, self-care programs for workers, and survivors to push balance back to life. The 360 has been able to help uh, get some programs evaluated. Uh, there's so much more that needs to be done in this area. And I hope that PQMD partners can look into that. Long-term products um, are needed. So building supplies, furniture, mattresses, certainly an area that Good360 is focused on. 
funding for local nonprofits, they're carrying the load, if there's sub grants available, those would be super helpful. And another way for PQMD members to help is transportation logistics. It's expensive to get products from the mainland to Maui. If you're able to help with logistics, that would be terrific. So recent updates, ash removal began January 16th with options to a temporary holding area. Again, after much debate, that's been going on. They need other locations. So that's still in progress. A $500 million interim housing plan will create that pool of 3,000 stable housing units that's in process. There've been some, some ramifications and consequences they weren't expecting about displacement of folks that were in those short-term rentals, um, but they're working on that. Portions of Lahaina are no, no longer under water advisory. Uh, actually, they're almost all out of water advisory at this point. And the mayor of Lahaina and Maui County, they've started hosting more town halls and what they call talk story sessions uh, to make sure that folks uh, at both sides of the discussion are being heard. This is a picture of the Roundhouse Council rendering of their new proposed building in Lahaina. I'm including it as just one of the symbols of hope. Uh, the people on Maui are, are very resilient. Um, they have a deep, intense love for their island and they are gonna find ways to make a difference. You can't ask me any questions, um, but you can email me if you have any. This is an example of one of those talk story events uh, being held by the county. A uh, couple more photos um, of the damage area uh, and also the governor and the mayor's office uh, where we were able to meet with uh, delegations uh, from the government entities, which was really helpful. Some of the tiny homes that are being worked on. Um, and again, there was a homeless uh, problem before the disaster. Now there's uh, buildings that they can use, and some of these tiny homes will be used for homeless shelters after transition to uh, final homes for survivors. Um, this is some of the nonprofits that we met with, and I just want to encourage everyone at PQMB to seek out those local nonprofits that are working, not ruling out those um, national groups that are that are helping. Uh, American Red Cross, Global Empowerment Mission, uh, St. Vincent de Paul Disaster Services Corporation, all of those helping out where they can. But the nonprofits at the local level have been carrying the load and they do deserve love and aloha as they, as they say. So I'm gonna stop sharing there. Again, I can't answer any questions here, but I look forward to getting questions and, and being able to answer them for you. Thank you for your time.